Welcome to Inbox Roundup number 14. Today we're going to talk about a correction for last week. Is marksmanship still valued? Chinese equipment quality. Why the U.S. Army has so many sergeants? Why Russia has circular trenches? Why do tanks have radar and using high Mars to clear minefields? A couple of things before I get started. I want to do something for you Air Force guys because I did something for the Navy with my Department of the Boat People shirt. So Bunker Branding made a Think Outside the Bomb t-shirt, hoodie, and sticker featuring the F-16 JDAM ER Glide Bomb as well. Uh, if you don't wear t-shirts, you can support the channel through a $5 membership on Substack or get a cameo greeting from me and the person in your life who likes the channel. I'm also going to be speaking at the Texas Cyber Summit, September 22nd to the 24th, speaking on the topic of how America will lose the next war. I'll be giving a lecture which covers deficiencies in DevOps, ISR, AI, chips, and information warfare. So if you want to meet me at the Texas Cyber Conference, you can sign up in the pinned comments below. Let's get started. Now last week there was a video where the Chieftain explained what the studs on a T-72 turret were for, and he got it wrong. Hey, I get things wrong all the time. I even made a video about how I incorrectly identified a mackerel pistol. So the Chieftain wants to say a few things and make a correction. Well, it is time for Chieftain to eat a little bit of humble pie. I make mistakes. Not often, but I do. It's embarrassing. That's why I try to avoid them. It is very embarrassing to make a mistake when you're a guest on a colleague's channel. But what is unforgivable is if you don't own up and say, yeah, I don't messed up. So in this case, the answer I gave, the history of applique armor, was 98% correct with one niggling yet rather critical detail, and that was the fact that the actual question posed, what you got to at the end, was answered incorrectly. I misidentified the round lugs as ERA mounting points. Actually, the armor in question is it's an anti-radiation shielding called NADBOY, and these studs hold the shielding in place. It's also inside the vehicle, something called pod boy. It's the same basic idea. It was added to T-72s starting about 1983, and it stopped uh, being added when the T-72B3 came out you know, a couple of decades later. Basically, the ERA is mounted, as you can see, on the long, thinner studs, and the NAD boy is the smaller studs held in place. The NAD boy does actually burn off and fall off, so that's why you can sometimes see the studs left behind. So that is actually the short and correct answer. What can I say? Oops. Thank you for setting the record straight, sir. Next, Donald asks, How valuable is marksmanship with a rifle in the modern battlefield? I see lots of discussions about man pads and other weapons, but little about marksmanship. So, marksmanship is still important, but there's different philosophies when it comes to what marksmanship is really for. Essentially, there's only one squad tactic. Establish a base of fire on the bad guys, and if you can, flank around their sides. If you can't, then you break contact. The army tends to be machine gun focused. I often used to call it fighting the saw. Essentially, the saw is the squad automatic weapon, the M249 saw, and the fire team is essentially built around that saw because it is your most casually producing weapon. So you essentially fight the machine gun. You try to get that machine gun in the place it can go where it can do the most damage to your adversary. So the fire team revolves around the saw. The platoon, the army platoon, revolves around the heavy weapons, mainly the M240 Bravo machine gun. So marksmanship is still important. The army thought it was so important that essentially every single soldier has an optic on their right, either an M68 uh, CCO or an ACOG OC. The Marine Corps is a little bit different. The Marine Corps is a smaller branch, and they can focus on marksmanship. The Marine Corps also has three fire teams per squad instead of the Army's two fire teams. So theoretically, with two additional fire teams in the Marine Corps, you can gain volume of fire over your adversary. Uh, and it got to the point where the Marines actually took away the saw to simplify logistics because their, their squads are bigger. They have higher volume of fire. You don't have to worry about a separate different kind of belt ammunition for the squad automatic weapon. So marksmanship is still important, but the army tends to fight the machine gun and a lot of our tactics revolve around getting that machine gun into the fight. Next, Da asks, I was wondering if Chinese military equipment is also bad quality like most things made assembled in China. Considering the drones they sold to the world ended up being of lesser quality compared to their Western or even Eastern counterparts, 
Feeling so far as being shot down by a supposedly Turkish slave around Libya, does this confirm the horrible quality of their equipment, or is it just a bad example? So, China's equipment is good for what China does, which is nothing. Uh, China's last war against Vietnam was in 1977, and they performed poorly. The drone thing is an issue. I've often said, if you want to buy a drone, go to Turkey. Turkey is the Costco Kirkland brand of weapon systems. It doesn't cost a lot, and it's good quality. Um, China sold, uh, I think, six uh, CH-4B drones, and then they, they, they sold them to Jordan, and Jordan got rid of them after three years because they just weren't worth um, the Type 96 tank has an autoloader, which is similar to the T-72, the, the Type 96 Chinese main battle tank. We all know what happens to the uh, Russian tanks when they get hit. Uh, China's main rifle, the uh, QBZ-95, uh, isn't left-handed friendly. Um, this may not be a big deal because in many Asian countries, left-handed children are taught how to be right-handed. It's kind of a cultural thing. So I think that China's equipment is good enough for an army that marches in parades. Uh, and I think we've seen this movie. So I wouldn't discount some things like China's hypersonic missiles. That They are almost definitely a danger to America's, air, America's aircraft carriers. And uh, I think their, their copies of Russian flankers are, are probably good fighters. Uh, but I think that the Chinese military equipment is good quality for what they're doing right now stemming from the fact that they really don't have real-world experience in combat. Austin asks, something that seems unique to the U.S., how many types of sergeants they have, staff sergeant, first sergeant, etc., and they seem to have responsibilities at lower echelon. For example, the section of eight might be led by a corporal in the British or Irish armies, while an eight-strong U.S. squad is led by a staff sergeant. My question is this, why does the U.S. have so many kinds of sergeant, why, and does it have any impact on joint operations, with U.S. allies and ranks or responsibilities are matched differently. So I actually had to research this question because I wasn't sure of the answer, and I had learned some stuff doing this. And basically, in the U.S. Army, you have the ranks, NCO ranks, corporal, then sergeant, then staff sergeant, sergeant first class, master sergeant, sergeant major, and then command sergeant major. Whereas the British Army has corporal, sergeant, staff sergeant, and then you kind of start getting into warrant officer ranks. And the more I researched this, the more I realized that... This could be an entire video on its own, and I still might do that, but here are the basics of why I think this system is like this. The British system basically descended from aristocracy and was a class-based system. You might be a landed gentleman and therefore an officer in the king's army, but that didn't really mean you knew gunnery. So the British needed a rank system which showed that a person had expertise but was not an officer, and I think that's where officers by royal warrant kind of came in. America never really had a class system. Anyone could become an officer. In fact, in the early days of the colonial militia, officers were actually elected by the men of the town that they served on. So from, from my research, I think the reason the U.S. Army created so many different kinds of sergeants came from the wars on the frontier. The U.S. fought Native American tribes from the 1860s all the way up to like 1911 and arguably up until 1918. And the American frontier is so big that you might have an outpost on the frontier run by a first sergeant whose main qualification was that he could read. So America got used to sergeants running things to a point where by 1920, you had color sergeant, supply sergeant, radio sergeant, 11 different grades of sergeant first class, three grades of sergeant, two grades of master gunner, and an assistant band leader. So the U.S. Army just created the rank of staff sergeant for all. As for how... This impacts working together with different kinds of NATO ranks. We, we normally go by a NATO code. Uh, people think that NATO is an alliance, but it's also a standards organization. They standardize ammunition, ejection routes for weapons, and, and even ranks. So we normally use NATO codes. I retired as a sergeant first class, and all I had to do was look at a chart and know that I'm equivalent to a color sergeant in the British Army. So normally, if you're operating with a foreign nation, you kind of get to know their ranks pretty quickly. Um, and it's never a problem that you're a staff sergeant and the British squad leader is a corporal. Like, you know that the two of you are equivalent based on experience and based on that rank chart. Uh, next, Heath asks, Deep State added the Russian defense lines and fortifications to their map. I couldn't help but notice that some of the trenches south of Voldar, near Stepan and 
Peridov have small circular geometry instead of the more traditional long lines of trench fortifications such as further north. You explain the shape of the trenches and why one would choose one geometry over another. Um, so some Russian trenches do look circular, as you can see from this image from the drive. Uh, look, I was an infantryman for 20 years, but I was a heavy weapons and anti-armor infantryman. I rode in vehicles. I didn't dig in no trench for my gun truck, all right? Uh, so I brought in combat engineer t Squire, who actually knows a thing or two about trenches. When it comes to trenches, there's always going to be pros and cons, especially with the shape of your trench, the length of your trench, and the placement of your trench. Now, Trenches, we don't think Russia, Ukraine, we go to World War I, trench warfare. But here's what you need to know. The reason why those trenches were so long and nearly straight is because the trenches during World War I, they were creating the battle space. That's why you had these near perfect rectangle battle spaces because the trenches were long and they were trying to make sure they couldn't get outmaneuvered or outflanked by the opposing trench. Now fast forward to Russia, Ukraine, the battle space is creating the trench. Here's what I mean by that. If Russian troops are going to guard an intersection, it wouldn't make sense to have a perfectly straight long trench. No, you're going to want to have a curved trench or a circle trench to where you can guard all parts of the intersection. Also, this allows them to not get outmaneuvered or outflanked with having a circle trench. Now, when it comes to having a long, straight trench, just like in World War I, these trenches were really long not to get outmaneuvered or outflanked. And typically, the Russians will assume that there's going to be some sort of armored column, or this is going to be an area where Ukrainian troops are going to try passing through here. So we're going to try and make our trench as long as possible so that the Ukrainians can't outmaneuver, can't outflank us, and they're going to have to face us head on through this trench. So the simple answer to your question is, Russia is truly just trying to react to the battle space. Whether it's a circle trench, a long trench, it's all the same thing. You're just trying to block a maneuver, and hopefully you don't get outflanked or taken out by a drone. Hey, if you want to learn more about combat engineering, t Spy's channel is in the pinned comments below. Check him out. He, he knows what he's talking about. Tom asks, why don't tanks have periscopes like helicopters and submarines and radar to find big metal hunks? So, in a way, tanks do have periscopes. They're called vision blocks. These, they actually are periscopes. Essentially, they allow a crewman to remain safely inside the armored hull and allow them to look outside. As for why they don't have radar, it's, it's for a few reasons. The first is that they don't need them. Thermals are usually pretty good at finding and detecting enemy vehicles and soldiers. Second, radar puts out a signature. As soon as you turn that radar on, you're letting everybody on the battlefield know exactly where you are. And now you, you make yourself a beacon for adversary precision fires. Third, I think something sensitive like radar would probably last about five seconds in a tank on a battlefield with rounds or bouncing off of your hull. And fourth, it would increase the cost of each vehicle for not a lot of gain. But honestly, it's, it's because thermals are far more useful out to like 5,000 or so meters, and they don't give off an active signature that can make you a target. Finally, Eric asks, would the tungsten frag HIMARS rounds set off a tank of mines? If so, could a volley of these be used to clear a minefield? So Eric is asking about the M30A1 missile variant, which is compatible with the HIMARS system. Uh, this variant carries a warhead of uh, 180,000 tungsten BBs, like, like a giant shotgun. Usually, uh, mines are destroyed by sympathetic detonation. I'm not sure tungsten would cause a detonation. Like maybe it might cause the mine to malfunction if that tungsten BB happens to hit the mine dead on. Second, uh, the M30A1 has a dollar value associated with it. Now, I couldn't nail down an exact price because there's different prices, export or friend rates or, or whatever, but it seems like the M30A1 HIMARS variant costs about a quarter million dollars. It's, it's kind of the best I can do with that one. Um, so there are cheaper ways of breaching a minefield that are more effective. Um, and that being said, you know, this weapon system is a great weapon system for taking out troop concentrations or taking out command posts, and it would probably be wasted on a target like a minefield, even if it, if it did work. It's, it's honestly more cost effective to send a dude out there and see when they get blown up. And that's when you bring the Miklik up and start plowing the mines and shooting the mine clearing line charges. 
that's pretty much it. Again, uh, come see me at the Texas Cyber Summit this September. The link is below. Thank you so much for watching, and take us out, Elon. Oh, hi, America. It's me, Elon. Uh, if you want to be cool like me, go and get a Ryan McBeth t-shirt or hoodie from Bunker Branding. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get a high mile shirt because it fires rockets, and rockets are pretty cool, just like me. Ha 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 ha, you fool. It is me, Mark Zuckerberg, from Facebook. And I will be the coolest once I get a Patriot shirt because the system is fully automated, just like me. <laughs> I'm going to get a U.S. Navy Department of the Boat People hoodie because I love their management style. Now, I will be cooler than any of you lads once I get my drone sweet drone shirt. Now, I'm going to get a landmine marker shirt because they blow up just like windows. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to get. Oh, no, it is Steve Wozniak from uh, Apple. That's right, you nerds. You think you're the coolest for wearing a shirt? Well, Ryan Macbeth is all the work, yeah. So go buy a shirt from Bunker Branding to fund Ryan Macbeth to increase your understanding. Oh, yeah!